From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. This is Charlie DeBaca down at headquarters. You left a call for me? That's right, Inspector. Thought you went back to Hartford. What now? The company I represent happens to hold an insurance policy on Dan Valentine. They asked me to stay here in New Orleans and look into this attempt on his life. How'd they hear about it so fast? Well, it was in all the papers and on the wire services. Valentine's always been news, ever since Prohibition. Yeah, a guy like him would be. But you know as much as I do, Donna, no lead yet. He's still quiet about the whole thing? Just like a mouse who won't open up, except to say he'll take care of it himself. Maybe it'll help matters when he finds out the insurance company's interested. You know something? What? I don't think me, you, the whole force, the insurance company, or anybody else can keep that bird alive unless he helps us. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account, submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the New Britain Mutual Insurance Company, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Valentine matter. Expense account continued. Item three, three bucks. One telegram to Roy Vickers in Hartford requesting a copy of the policy contracts between New Britain Mutual and Dan Valentine. Plus the name and location of the beneficiary and any other debt on the case. After that, I walked over to the police station and looked up Inspector DeBaca. Sit down. Thanks. I don't quite get this, Dollar. What's your part? Well, the insurance company would like a full report on everything that's happened, that's all. You could give them that on the back of your thumbnail, couldn't you? Not quite, Inspector. Oh, you mean a separate report from what we have? Something like that, yes. Well, it's their dough. They can spend it any way they want to, I guess. If there's any reason for them canceling the policy on Valentine, they'll do it. The fact that somebody shot at him a couple of times and came near killing him is one thing. The fact that he won't open his mouth about it is another. They're looking for a way out? I didn't say that. They just want to make sure about everything, that's all. An insurance policy is a contract, mutually beneficial to both parties. Both parties have to keep the line of that contract. They don't figure Danny Valentine's running around shooting himself insurance money. (sighs) Inspector, they don't figure anything. Well, now that you've been official, be unofficial. What's your idea? Well, Valentine's got a legitimate policy with the company. They don't want to see him kill. They tell me to investigate the shooting. Actually, they're telling me to see to it that he stays alive and well. Well, that makes sense. Good luck. If you'll sort of let me tag along on the case, I'd appreciate it. Well, we'll see. Oh, what's the matter now? It just occurred to me, Valentine bought a house out in Jefferson Parish three months ago, a couple of days after he was released from federal pen. Now, he's lived there quiet, minding his own business, keeping his nose out of trouble. Yeah. Well, as long as a man does that, even a man with a background like Valentine's, as long as a man does that, we don't bother him, and he doesn't bother us. Well, so? So what happens? Yesterday, you meet him and have a couple of drinks with him. Hello, goodbye, boom, boom, he gets shot twice by somebody, somewhere. You a bad news boy? Now, that's as wild as you can get. We had nothing together except the drinks. You sure? I'm sure. Well, I'm thinking about it just the same. Here. Be back in a minute. The bulky, thick folder Inspector DeBaca shoved across the desk at me was marked Valentine Daniel. It started in 1915 and was fat with yellowed clippings all the way through 1942. It was a pretty good history of Dan Valentine and the age he lived in. He was born in Ireland and had fought in the Irish Rebellion. He was regarded as both hero and scoundrel. For his own good, he came to America. Somehow, he started out in the wholesale drug business. And understandably, it was an easy step to making prohibition alcohol. And an even easier step to make prison on an income tax evasion charge. The folder mentioned a wife and a daughter who seemed to have successfully avoided most of the newspaper headlines that had involved Dan Valentine. There was one picture of Mrs. Valentine taken in 1928. That's about as far as I got when DeBaca came back into the room, not alone. Interesting stuff? Very, Inspector, very. Well, here's something more interesting. My men have been covering the neighborhood where the shooting happened yesterday afternoon. 
This man's a witness. This is Mr. Dollar. He's an insurance investigator. It's Willie Blakely. Oh, how, how do you do, sir? Hope you can help us, Willie. Well, I can try, hmm? I, I really didn't see too much. You see, I was on my milk truck, and I saw this fellow, this, this big fellow, walking down the street. Uh, what's his name? Dan Valentine. Yes, sir. Well, he was just walking, like for an early morning walk, and then I saw this car come around the corner, and there were a couple of men in it. What kind of car? I think it was a Buick sedan. I'm not sure. It was a black car. You happen to get the license number? No. All right, go on. Well, sir, this Mr. Valentine, he looked up when he saw it coming, and he stopped. You know, kind of funny? No, I don't know. Tell me. Well, you know, like he was surprised. Do you think he was surprised at who was in the car? Yes, sir, that's it. He, he sort of smiled. Not a hello kind of a smile. Hmm? Sort of a sad smile. Didn't wave, just stood there. I couldn't see the men in the car by then, so I don't know how they were looking at him. Did you see them as they rounded the corner? Yeah, just a couple of fellas, dark coats and hats. Would you know them if you saw them again? Uh, <laughs> I don't think so, Captain. Okay, two men. Yes, sir. So this, this Mr. Valentine stopped and, and looked at him and, and gave him this kind of smile. He recognized him, you think? Oh, yeah. And then I heard a noise, you know, something like whack, whack. And Mr. Valentine fell down and a car drove off. Did Valentine go for a gun? No, sir. What did you do then? Well, I got out of there. Why? I didn't know what was happening. I didn't want to get hurt. You didn't even try to help him? No, sir. I was scared. I didn't know what that whack whack was, sir. And it took you all this time to tell us about it. I'm sorry, Captain. Ah. Darling. Yeah. You got something to worry about. Hmm? That noise he was talking about didn't sound like regular gunshots, or he would have said so. Silence, sir. What else? <laughs> Inspector DeBaca continued to question the witness, trying to ascertain more details about the shooting, the car, and the men inside the car. Four hours later, when I left, he was still at it. Some more expenses. Item four, two dollars and a half. Cab fare from police station to hospital. I thought I'd drop in and take a chance on Dan Valentine coming across with some information. Sorry, no visitors. It's pretty important. I'm a friend of his. I'm sorry. When can I see him? It's hard to say. Mr. Valentine's condition is not too good. What? Well, nothing to be alarmed about. He lost so much blood that he's in a weakened condition. The doctor's ordered a transfusion. Oh. You can phone in later if you like. Excuse me. Yes, ma'am? I should like to see Mr. Valentine, please. I'm sorry. I was just telling this gentleman. That's impossible. How is he? He needs rest. The doctor feels he'd be better off without visitors at the moment. Thank you. I had a feeling about the gray-haired, well-dressed woman, and I hurried after her down the long corridor outside the hospital. I was just in time to see her take a cab that had been waiting at the curb. I managed to hail one myself, and we tagged along Canal Street behind her until she paid off the driver in front of the Roosevelt Hotel. I was right behind her when she stopped in the lobby and got a key to room 1016. I gave her five minutes, then I knocked on her door. Yes? Hello, Mrs. Valentine. My name's Johnny Dollar. Ann Valentine looked at me for a long time. I had to hand it to her. There were no tears, no frowns or screams. Just a wide, frank look from a woman who, by any man's standards, had once been beautiful. I haven't been called by that name for many years. You're a reporter, of course. No, I'm not. I'm an insurance investigator. In a policeman's office today, I saw one of the few pictures ever taken of you. At this hotel, I'm registered under the name of Ann Ward. Ward is good enough for me, Mrs. Valentine. May I come in? Yes. Now, what is it you want, Mr. Dollar? Possibly the same thing you want. To keep your husband alive. I believe that's up to the doctors, isn't it? Not quite. If he was shot at once and he won't help the police find out who did it, there's a reasonable chance he'll be shot at again. Do you know who did it? Well, who it might be. Look, the police have found a witness who describes two men as having done the shooting. Can you add anything to that? Mr. Dollar, I haven't seen Dan in over 13 years. I haven't written to him, talked to him, or contacted him in any way, either while he was in prison or these last few months he's been out. I see. It was his idea. But he must have had a reason. He did. Our daughter. Oh. 
She believes that Ward was her dead father's name. Do I make myself clear? Yeah. I read about the shooting. I caught the first plane here because I thought I might help Dan. My daughter thinks I'm on a little vacation by myself. You don't believe me, do you? Well, in view of what you've just said about not having written to him for 13 years... That was the way he wanted it. I was never ashamed of Dan, never. He was ashamed of himself and how his activities might affect us. He gave me everything I ever had out of life. In New Salem, that's where we live, and live very well because Dan saw to that part of it before he went to prison. We are considered very proper people, Teresa and myself. Dan sacrificed a great deal for that consideration. I think that you've sacrificed a great deal yourself, Mrs. Valentine. When I go back to the hospital to see him tonight, he'll probably tell me to pack my bag and go home, that there's nothing to worry about. But there is something to worry about, isn't there, Mrs. Valentine? He won't talk about it, and you won't talk about it, and both of you know all about it. Oh, Mr. Dollar, you're a very young man. I'm sorry if I sound like I could help you. I can't. Please go. I went back to my hotel and had some dinner. Then after a while, I put in a phone call to the hospital and found out I could talk to Dan Valentine between 7.30 and 9. About then, a special delivery came for me. It contained the information I wanted regarding the policy on Dan Valentine. I noticed that the beneficiary was a jewel affair, wife and daughter, Anne and Teresa Ward. I had to check with Inspector DeBaca just once more. No luck. He had been unable to identify or locate the two killers described by the witness. He was trying to trace the car. 7.30 on the dot, I was at the hospital. The reception desk seemed reluctant to talk and referred me to the head nurse who happened to be out to dinner, who referred me to the surgical nurse who took me aside and told me to find a crystal ball. Mr. Valentine's gone. We have no idea where. How could he be gone? We started to give him a transfusion. He jumped up suddenly, knocked down one of the male nurses, grabbed his clothes and ran out of the hospital. Just as simple as that. I thought he was in a serious condition. Shh, keep your voice down. He was in a serious condition. And it's going to be critical pretty soon running around town, bleeding from two bullet wounds. If you want to keep him alive, Mr. Dollar, you better find him and find him fast. I thought over what Dan Valentine had told me in the hospital earlier, about taking care of the matter himself. And the more I thought about it, the more I realized he was going to do just that, even if it killed him. There'll be another intriguing episode in our story of the Valentine matter tomorrow. Tomorrow, what happens to a 30-year-old grudge when somebody explains it with bullets? Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by John Dawson, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for another exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. <laughs>